Hey all you educators, parents, and lifelong learners out there. I wanna take you on a quick little adventure today. I want you to close your eyes for a moment and imagine yourself as a child with your favorite book. I've got a couple of mine right here. You can peek for just a second. Here's some of my old favorites. And I just still love looking at them. This one was passed down from my mother and, I, and it's an old basil reader, but I love the stories inside. Many of you are probably familiar with this one. Little House on the Prairie. It's all torn up. Doesn't matter. I still love it and I save on to it. All right, close your eyes back. It might have been that the books were old and tattered and torn like the ones I showed you. Or it may have been the latest one just off the shelves from your school library. Do you remember those moments you got lost in your book and your imagination as you read the adventures, journeys, and experiences of the characters? Or how about when you got lost in another country, in your imagination, of course, studying the features of a majestic lion or a mighty but gentle elephant. Or maybe you read about the steps Egyptians used to make papyrus. Did you ever look at the characters as old friends or imagine yourself in those countries observing the creatures in person that you were reading about? Think for a second about some of those old friends and moments you experienced through the pages of your books. It probably still brings a warm spot to your heart. Okay, you can open your eyes now. Now, let me take just a minute to introduce myself. If you haven't guessed already, I'm gonna to talk to you a little about reading today. I'm Faith Halleck. I'm a graduate student at USF. Go Bulls! My professor, Dr. Elizabeth Hadley, has given me an opportunity through my class, RAD 6544, Cognition, Comprehension, and Content Area Reading, Remediation of Reading Problems. Whew, that was a mouthful of alliterations hiding out in there. Anyway, she's given me the opportunity to share with you all a little bit about reading. And we're going to touch on uh, three questions. First, we're gonna look at how the brain plays a role in reading comprehension. We're also gonna look at some basics in teaching reading comprehension and how you can ensure the children we're blessed with to guide that they can comprehend both word and world. You might be saying, Faith, what do you mean by word and world? I kind of thought about that for a minute the first time I heard it put like that, but you'll find it's something you're used to already probably. So hold on tight, we're saving that part for last. Okay, enough of the technicalities, let's get this learning started. Okay, so what is the role of the brain in reading comprehension? Well, when thinking of the brain in reading comprehension, we may often see it as a given that as readers, we use our brains and the processes within the brain to comprehend that which we read. However, what exactly is the role of the brain in reading comprehension? While reading doesn't come naturally to the human mind, you might be surprised to hear it can be simplistic, organic, and complex all at the same time. Our brain is responsible, according to Brown and DeWitt in their book, Building Comprehension, this one right here, Building Comprehension in Every Classroom, for the metacognitive processes of inferencing, inquiring, and connecting about and to what we read. So let's look together at exactly what that means. When we look at metacognition, we can see the simplistic way that many of you probably think about reading. Metacognition is thinking about our thinking. Keen and Zimmerman share that in their book, Mosaic of Thought, The Power of Comprehension Strategy and Instruction. So with that to comprehend, the brain must be able to think. If I were to ask you about comprehension, you'd probably say something like, it's being able to understand what we read, and you're not wrong. However, let's go a little deeper. I'd like to present you with a more formal definition I've put together. That reading comprehension is the reader's ability to understand and find meaning through contextual connections that the words and sentences are representing. That's my own formal definition. What you were thinking, just a little heavier, and you probably already know that the brain plays a big part in that role, but have you ever thought about all the things the brain does to help you comprehend? Now we could go on all day about all the neurons and brain cells. I'll put a little link below um, that you can check out to see more about that and the lobes that are working in the act of reading. But let's look at all the basics of it. The brain needs to first provide the processing to decode the words and place them together so that the reader can work through the maze of the words to comprehend. Once a reader has fluently decoded the words and sentences, 
the brain begins its amazing ability to begin making all kinds of connections to the words in the language they entail, experiences and background knowledge of the reader to the words and text as a whole. The reader may make connections to the topics, vocabulary and ideas within a text once their minds have connected to the concepts. Look at this little figure I have right here to demonstrate. It may also look at the language they already know to generate and retain the new knowledge presented and connected to the text. This pertains not only to experiences, but also to the vocabulary of the text. This permits the reader to process in the brain the new knowledge presented and begin to organize and file these new elements into files, so to say, of the brain to be kept in the memory process recesses of the mind. Then, as new schematic readings, experiences, and words are presented to the brain, it can connect to the new information and beget new knowledge, which can inevitably permit further connections and new knowledge to be grasped and retained, which enables comprehension. So reading makes the ability to read more. And with more complexity, with the knowledge and language built through prior readings, reading, reading, and reading some more. So where is the complexity in that? Well, while there's simplicity in the knowledge connecting to new knowledge, the complexity comes in the ability to cognitively dig deeper than the surface level. We should note, it is challenging to teach students to think critically. This is due to students' lack of knowledge base sometimes. The other issues that arise here is if a student only has a minimal knowledge to connect with, they may not be able to narrow down the exact points being represented. Strategies without a knowledge base fall flat. If there is a part of the brain that hinders the processing of all these questions, inferences and connections that are happening as a child is decoding and attempted to comprehend, the process can be hindered or delayed. So the brain is, as we assume I'm sure, where comprehension takes place, kind of like a factory processing new machines. All the inner workings of the computer systems, human workers and machinery have to work together to create the result and in reading being comprehension. How do we teach children to comprehend what they are reading? Teaching children to comprehend that which they read can be as simplistic, organic and complex as thinking of the brain's role we just discussed. Brown and DeWitt's in their book, Building Comprehension in Every Classroom, Instruction with Literature, Informational Text and Basal Programs, present that comprehension is comprised of background knowledge, metacognition, and motivation. So let's consider these elements for our discussion here. Students need their minds to be activated for reading, but first, they must have the ability to decode that which is brought before them fluently and with prosody for the mind charges to begin to activate the connections and files that they've already retained through early experiences with their families. These experiences may have been conversations, trips to the park or museums, camping trips and travels for vacations, board games they've played together, foods they've cooked together, and the wonderful and simplistic read aloud that so many families bond over with bedtime kisses and goodnight hugs. These experiences are the beginnings of bringing reading comprehension to a child's abilities and building a rich vocabulary from the oral language they are receiving. Beth McCow McCowan and Kukin discuss that in their book, Bringing Words to Life, Robust Vocabulary and Instruction. This also happens and brings our background knowledge needed for students to make the connections to the decoded words on the pages before them. According to Beck McCowan and Kukin, we can help students to become good comprehenders by providing the experiences to build the knowledge they're lacking and support their practice of it. So when children have been afforded a knowledge bank of experiences, they are being set up for success as comprehensive readers. And on the other side of that, 
If a child has not been afforded these experiences, this begins a child's unfortunate road to literacy potholes, which we often call learning gaps. The well-trained teacher must activate building the background knowledge necessary for a student to connect with the readings. Teachers have a wonderful platform to create buy-in and motivation for students as they present a summary of the experience they are about to embark on through picture walks, hook videos, and a look into background of a text or topic. Thus, connections, helping the student begin to connect to that which they are about to read. They can bring with this the purpose for reading, giving the student mind a bell, so to speak for that which will signal them for grasping the organization and intentions of the author. This is where the imagery and thinking come in for the student's metacognition to begin thinking about their thinking. This enables the student to have their mind process all the elements of the text. Another nod to the brain. Strategies must then be explicitly taught. Keen and Zimmerman recommend in their 2000 edition of Mosaic of Thought the teachers should teach strategies one at a time and cumulatively as they progress the student's knowledge and practice. However, when teaching strategies, teachers should be mindful to not go overboard with teacher talk and drilling strategies to the point that time is taken from students actually engaging in the activity of being challenged with the complexity of a reading text. Time is often taken up with too much teacher talk when the best practice is a child digging into a great text properly staged and released into the reading themselves with the teacher readily available as facilitator and conferencing as needed for growth through the complexity that they begin to grow through the challenge. Another great way is when they are permitted moments for student-led talk. These rich conversations that have been staged to encourage peers to discuss reading. Research shows provides the extra boost to get readers thinking about their thinking. Metacognition. Side note, teachers, after you've done the think aloud and modeling, step back and let the kids work on the tasks on their own. You have to stay quiet on this one and just facilitate because too much teacher talk can actually hold a student's thinking back. Did you know primary students really won't find many benefits from strategy instruction if they haven't yet adapted the ability to decode fluently, as it's often too difficult, especially for young or struggling readers. Their brains are having to focus so hard on decoding, it becomes too exhausting for the student to attempt strategies as well. We must think of strategies not as an end all, but as a tool that we are putting in students' hands to temporarily use as they grow and develop their abilities to process through a text. With strategies like decoding, word analysis, using clues as their tools, with background knowledge in tow, metacognition ready for processing, and motivation in check, students can begin to comprehend what they read through engaging in text. Before leaving this section, let's visit motivation for a minute. We've all known children who come to the table motivated to learn and doing as they're told. It's like they were born to be students and read everything they can get their hands on. But what do we do when motivation isn't a part of a student's makeup? You got it. It's our job to step in. As teachers, we first have to screen what's behind the absence of motivation from observation and conferencing. Is it because they lack ability and are at frustration level? Is the curriculum not presenting topics of the student's particular interest? Are they well fed and rested? These are basic things we see when thinking about motivation. There's usually more to it than to just saying a child is lazy. Something is holding the student back. It may be they're struggling with one of the three constructs identified by researchers Burns and Wasik in their text, Language and Literacy Development, What Educators Need to Know. It could be a child needs help with their goals as a reader, with their knowledge base or with their metacognition strategies. If we can identify the reason behind the lack, we can work with the child to remedy it. Brown and DeWitts point out that students that are good readers combine all these elements of strategies with background knowledge, metacognition and motivation. But the motivation cannot just be teacher led. 
It needs to be something the reader themselves embraces through their own goals, beliefs, and values. Along with this, it can't always be intensive for lessons and strategies, but also just for the sheer joy of reading and the connections one makes to the stories one beholds. How do we ensure children comprehend word and world? Now, just as I promised, here's a little about ensuring children comprehend word and world. For many of you, as I mentioned earlier, you may have been able to participate in some wonderful experiences growing up. You may have been read to at night, made to do your homework, had evening meals and conversations about your day with your family, listened to music and watched movies together. You probably went to museums, parks, and amusement parks. Maybe you were taken on vacations or traveling journeys to see family. Did you know all these moments were teaching you about your world and giving you what we call in the education field, background knowledge? At the same time, the whole time you were participating in these moments, you were learning new words and getting exposed to rich vocabulary from the experiences you were enjoying to make even more connections. I know when my family traveled, my dad was always reading the billboards as we drove. My brother and I giggled about it after we grew up and even impersonated him doing it when I went out on my own one time. After I read all this great research, I discovered, hey, my dad was teaching me to read while we drove. I don't even remember not being able to read things like McDonald's signs and Sears and Kmart store icons. They were before Target and Walmart. Other restaurant signs and businesses too. And we could go on and on. He and my mom also read to me every day. And not just from textbooks or storybooks. They read from recipes when we cooked. We played board games like we said earlier. Religious books to teach me about my faith. And oh, the beloved old Sears cattle. We used to have to do our Christmas wishing by staring at a giant magazine type book called a catalog. This was before there was an Amazon. Anyway, that was teaching me how to read too. No, it probably wasn't always intentional. But nevertheless, it was working. They also read letters from the family for all you young people out there. We used to have to write with a pencil or pen on paper to send a message back and forth to family and friends and businesses. Then wait for days and even sometimes months for it to get there and for the person to respond. I remember I had to write months ahead one time for a fifth grade project on a state for information. Now within seconds, it's all at our fingertips. I know you've all heard of snail mail, but hey, did you see what I was just doing there? I was building your background knowledge and you didn't even know it. Maybe you did. Anyway, all of these normal parts of life were providing me with wonderful world knowledge. And word knowledge to help me when I start reading. And still to this day, background knowledge gives a child the word knowledge to make connections to words. At the same time, these experiences also provide word knowledge to comprehend. Now there is another side to this. There are some children who do not get these same experiences or maybe their experiences are different from the ones you had as a child or I had. We all come from different walks of life, socioeconomic statuses and cultures. All of this plays a role in our world knowledge too. Some children are not read to or made to do homework. And no, this is not a good thing for any of you that are still in school and looking over your mom's shoulder. Some students haven't had conversations around a family table or maybe they haven't had opportunities to go on a trip to the beach or amusement parks. Maybe they live in another community or country where some families are not able to do these things or they don't know what a pivotal element of a child's development that these moments are. And sometimes it may just not be a part of their culture. This can affect students' ability later to read and comprehend that which they read if they do not come in with a schematic palimpsest of background knowledge necessary of both their world and words to make connections needed to comprehend the books they're assigned or they attempt. Did you just notice the juicy word I said there? 
I said palimpsest. Just a few months ago, I had never heard of that word before. I was taking my first graduate studies class and the word was in an article I was reading. It stumped me for sure. I didn't have word knowledge to connect to it and the text for me did not lend to defining it from the context of the reading. So I had to look it up. Wait for it. Here is where I'm about to use this as an example for my point. When I looked up the word, I read that a palimpsest was a writing material, like the parchment of a tablet or brass. A long time ago, people didn't have paper and technology at their fingertips or a Walmart to run and grab more paper so they run, use it up. People used to have to rub out old writings and write over top of the remnants left behind. This would create kind of a layering of writing. So when my reading said a palimpsest, I was able to connect that with my world knowledge of how Egyptians used to make parchment paper and write on tablets or papyrus, I should say, and write on tablets and walls beyond looking up the definition. I was able to use that world knowledge to connect to the juicy word palimpsest and gain word knowledge. My knowledge begot comprehension. Then I was able to retain and grasp meaning to add it to my word knowledge. And now I use that word every chance I get. This is just my point for students. We can ensure their word and world knowledge by helping them tap into background knowledge or set up their schema of our world if they have it or words, if they have that to comprehend their reading. If they don't have either, and it's up to us to build and activate it for them. This reigns even in the simplistic nature of our imagination. But before we go to imagination, I have a few examples from some colleagues of mine where I tried out some world and word knowledge with them with that juicy word palimpsis. Let's see how they did. Okay. Hello, Ms. Heitzen Writer. Hello. Uh, I have a question for you. My question is, have you ever heard of the word palimpsist? Palimpsist? No, I have not. Okay. Well, you want to take a guess at what it might mean? Palimpsist? Makes me think of something plump. So the word is, you ready for it? Palimpsest. Palimpsest. <laughs> okay, the word okay. is palimpsest. Palimpsest? Have you ever heard of that word before? No, I have not. Okay, okay. it's right here. Palimpsest. Uh huh. Palimpsest. Yeah, okay. it's a really juicy word. It is. So uh, do you have any idea just by looking at the word, not reading the sentence yet, but just looking at the word, what it might mean? I have the slightest clue. Okay. The word is palimpsest. 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 So the word is palimpsest. 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 I have not seen that word. I don't know what it means. Okay. I had neither when I first yeah. met it not too long ago in a book. So I have a juicy word that I want to share with you. And the word is palimpsest. This is the word right here. Palimpsest. Okay. I'm going to give you a, a little bit of background on where, where the word comes from. Um, it comes from back a long time ago, many, many hundreds of years ago, um, when Egyptians and people like that used to have to write on papyrus. Mm -hmm. And they would um, not be, or on stone or bronze, and they couldn't really erase what they wrote, but they still needed to write again. So they would try and wipe out what they said, but it would still leave hints underneath, and then they would write over top of that. So with that in mind, I'm going to give you palimpsest in a sentence, and I want to see if you can kind of decode or define what that word means in the sentence now that you've heard that background knowledge. Okay. okay? So the sentence is, there was a palimpsest of ideas given during the collaboration to evolve the plan's new growth. So what do you think that might be trying to say? Um, I would say various, um, many, yeah, um, um, various, many, um, wise, okay. different, okay. different types maybe. Hmm. So that makes me think about they had whiteboards. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and they were wiping them out mm. and writing back over them. Okay. But, or because if you're saying that they had that it you know went over it means that they redid work that they already mm. had. They were scratching out the work that they already had and making new work. A I can't think of words right now. <laughs> A, maybe a revamped list of ideas, okay. um, something that was collaborated on, multiple ideas. Well, I'm looking at the word ideas and it ends with an S, so that means it's plural. And then of course, palimpsis ends with an EST. It lets me know that there's more than one. There was a palimpsis of ideas given. Seems like there was a lot of I uh, like, like a lot of ideas mm -hmm. and plans, suggestions. Hmm. Um. And tell me kind of your thought process that so you're thinking I'm, and connecting. I'm thinking. Um, because you said that it was under, so it's kind of like a print or shadow okay. of uh, different ideas okay. that were under. Okay. So that's what I'm thinking because you said they wrote over it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it has something to do with writing. Okay. That's where my mind is going. Okay. Um, during, so there was enough abundance. Okay, so with that world knowledge in mind and seeing it in this sentence, what do you think it might mean? <laughs> I'm guessing like, like a bunch of stuff kind of all spread neatly all over the place. Okay. That's kind of where I'm going for it. Okay. Um, just based on the back in the, um, with the Egyptians and you didn't get it all off. So there's still something there. Okay. Um, that's what I'm going with. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, the word in that sentence might mean like a conglomeration of ideas or a sharing of ideas, um, uh, like ideas on top of ideas. Type okay. Of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. It, yeah. You're that's that's right in the ballpark. Oh, good. Um, it is a layering of things. Okay. So the, in this situation, a layering of those ideas. All right. Good. Well, I thank wasn't you. That far off. You're yeah. Welcome. Very good, Mr. Filarkey. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead. Okay. So when you were explaining to me. I immediately connected that word to something like Greek mythology. Mm. It sounded like, um, or like Pompeii. Yes. It sounded like that to me. Yes. Um, but at Epcot, they mm -hmm. have a ride, and I can't remember what it's called, but uh -huh. it has the history of writing. Oh. And so when you were explaining that to me, it has the Egyptians and hieroglyphics through that ride. Cool. So that would be something if I was teaching a class yes. that I may even play a tour of that ride. Very Good. to connect the different time periods yes. of how writing has been through. Very good. Thank you. Uh -huh. So thank you all my friends and colleagues for being willing to participate in my little experiment. I hope that that gave you a good example of what it means to try and, and use word and world knowledge to help students make connections together. In our technology-filled world, many students have not had the opportunity to create images of their own in their imaginations. That's a foreign thought to me as I think about this and reflect on myself lying on the carpet of my house, studying the pages of an old faithful book I mentioned earlier. I would imagine myself with the characters and in the events as I read the words and studied the illustrations. We need to explicitly model this for students as well. The ability to create images in their own minds read aloud and the modeling of thinking during the reading aloud and thinking aloud. This is where the teacher's role becomes so much more important. If a student has not had world knowledge of an experience or topic, then we the teachers need to activate the knowledge before setting them off in a book that they otherwise may not be able to make connections enough to comprehend since they have not experienced either the world experience of it or the words it contains enough to make the connections. Teachers can also do this by carefully pre-selecting the concepts which they have planned for children to read and giving foundational information so students are ready to access the new ideas presented in text. Hook videos, as we've talked about before, and visuals are great 
for setting the stage to provide a schema for students to begin engaging in the text and bringing their world and word knowledge to the forefront of their minds as they read to comprehend and learn. When we think of words and words that connect with our world, we may think we receive them both together. However, there is a distinction between facts of the world and facts of words. However, while the world knowledge must be invoked, the distinction does not retain the comprehension of a world fact over a word fact. So as we engage students in vocabulary instruction to connect them to words, they can engage at the same time with both world and word experiences equally at the same time. So while it's a problem for a reader if they do not have background word knowledge, it's equally a problem if a student does ha doesn't have adequate word knowledge. With this in mind, the teacher should select four to six useful words from the text that they can teach through student-friendly short definitions. Just as with the word knowledge lessons, it's important to teach words explicitly with examples and non-examples, visuals to illustrate their meanings, as well as provide clarifying questions with words in different contexts to be sure students are not only gaining multiple exposures, but also to ensure understanding of the word. Thank you for joining me for this brief look into the world of comprehension. I hope you'll take away some key points here. And remember, you as a teacher or family of a developing reader can work alongside the brain of the reader to provide a palimpsest of both word and world knowledge through everyday fun and life experiences. Did you see what I did there? Thanks for joining me. Check out my references in the description below. Thanks, Dr. Hadley, for this opportunity.